I'm a little bit too, um, too young, surprisingly, to have seen these films uh, at the cinema or the drive-in, which we have in Australia. I'm not sure you guys in the UK have drive-ins, but we certainly had a large number of them in Australia when I was growing up. And uh, so I remember really vividly seeing um, the films Patrick and Snapshot and uh, The Man from Hong Kong on TV, late night TV when I was a kid. And um, to me, they just were like American or English films, genre films, but they had these Australian locations and Australian accents. So I felt a, a connection to them that possibly I didn't do with a whole lot of other films. And with The Man from Hong Kong, um, the first five minutes in The Man from Hong Kong is a chopper chase and, uh, and a fist fight on top of Ayers Rock. And uh, to a kid, that was the most exciting thing I'd ever seen. So I went to actually read about these films um, after seeing them on TV in Australian books on Australian history of film and realised they weren't even listed at all. They were, they were just ignored. And um, I also got to know Richard Franklin, the director of Patrick and Road Games, and he just made Psycho 2, the sequel to Hitchcock Psycho, when I met him. He, uh, he'd gone to my high school in Australia and I invited him to come and chat and had to introduce him to the, to the school. That's when I was about 14. And, um, and went to read about Richard too and he wasn't in any of the books. So I kind of knew early on that there was this whole untold, undocumented history on a large section of Australian films and other films that I, that, that I liked more than, you know, the Picnic at Hanging Rocks and the, the Getting of Wisdoms. So yeah, there was a, the, uh, in a way, um, you know, someone had to tell the story and it ended up being me. The one thing that a lot of people don't realise about Australia is that um, in the 70s, Australia embraced its art house films as its mainstream films. So audiences in Australia flocked to see Picking Hanging Rock, The Getting of Wisdom, Break a Morant, um, My Brain Career, all those very nostalgic, um, soft focus, lovely period films. And any film that wasn't like that was considered a B-movie. So all the films that were made in Australia that were just regular genre films that would have been considered commercial genre films anywhere else in the world were considered embarrassments. Why are we making these American films? We should be making Australian films. And that, that stigma was still around when we tried to get the documentary made. Um, a lot of people thought that this wasn't a worthy documentary because who cares about these films? I'd um, been lucky enough to have a decent career as a music video director in Australia and made a lot of clips and had made sure that um, I worked with old school crews who'd all worked on these films so I could sit around and at lunchtime and chat to them about them. So I knew that they all had great stories. And it, was, it seemed to me that all that remained in terms of the history of this whole massive amount, of, you know, this whole selection of films was the critical reaction. Um, the cast, the crews and the audience's reaction had never been documented. So that's what I really wanted to do with Not Quite Hollywood. And it was hard to get that past the funding bodies. Um, we went through four rounds with the funding bodies and each time we were told that there were more appropriate documentaries pretty much to, or more, more appropriate films to get finance than ours. And in the end it was only through, um, through getting a large chunk of money internationally, both from um, Magnolia, HDNet and from Optimum that we managed to um, almost forced the hand of the Australian funding bodies to, to give us the money to, to make it. So it was a long time, it was about 10 years um, from you know, starting to think about the project to actually finishing it. In a way, we were really lucky. Uh, people have said to me, you know, uh, don't you wish the doco had been made 10 years ago when you first started thinking about it? And in a way, um, we wouldn't have had an end if that had been the case because we wouldn't have had Wolf Creek, we wouldn't have had the Saw guys, we wouldn't have had, it would have been a quite depressing uh, end to the doco because genre films would still be in limbo in Australia. It was interesting, before we made the film, we, we had um, a lot of feedback from um, people, particularly, I guess, in the, in the cultural body saying, who on earth is gonna wanna talk to you about these films? Uh, and in the end, we found that the exact opposite was true. Everyone wanted to talk to us about them. Um, I think it was because no one had ever asked these people about these films before. And um, the, the most, a large majority, 99% of the interviewees, weren't embarrassed at all by these films. They, were, they, they had a, a great affection for them. So it was amazing sitting there talking to people like John Seale, who you know won an Oscar for The English Patient, shooting The English Patient. And there he is talking about being a camera operator on, you know, 
sexploitation films like Alvin Purple and, um, and knocking people down with cars uh, on The Man from Hong Kong. But, but he was so um, enthusiastic and, 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 and joyful telling us about those stories. It was, it was, it was great. Four of us travelled around the world shooting these interviews and it was seat of the pants filmmaking. We didn't, I didn't know who I was going to be interviewing the next day, so I was literally writing questions for the next day every night in the hotel room. And uh, it, was, it was a very interesting journey making it. But, you know, we were, we were incredibly lucky. We, uh, we got an amazing array of people. Um, there were very few people who said no, and the people who said no didn't say no for, um, for, for reasons of embarrassment about these films. They said no because they wanted to be paid or things like that, stupid reasons. I remember saying to one guy, you know, um, if I was making a documentary on gardeners, I wouldn't be paying every gardener I interviewed for it. So, you know, you have to understand we can't pay anyone. But, um, so, yeah, we were, we were blessed. I mean, just sitting opposite Jamie Lee Curtis and Dennis Hopper and Stacey Keach and people like that, yeah, I just was thinking... Surely you people have better things to do with your life than sit here talking to these crazy idiots from Australia about a film you made you know, 30 years ago that you probably didn't enjoy very much. Not Quite Hollywood features clips from about 100 um, Australian films. And these aren't the most high profile Australian films. So it was, we were lucky in a way that we, had, uh, we have a National Film and Sound Archive in Australia where a large majority of the, um, the original film materials had been preserved. But for them to give to us about, I think we ended up getting about 400 film cans off them to grade, was a huge undertaking. And it all had to be done in stages. And it got to a crazy point where um, to get the material out of them in stages, we had to be transferring the scenes that we needed before we'd actually got to cut the sequences themselves. So it was sort of chicken before the egg stuff. It was really difficult. Um, so in the end, we, we ended up grading a lot more stuff than we really needed to that didn't end up in the, in the docker because we, we cut original sequences and they'd run for 12 minutes and in the end, they'd end up being three or four minute sequences in the film. So it was, it was a huge undertaking. There was some material that wasn't there and I spent a lot of time scurrying around in garages of um, widows of filmmakers and uh, there was one film in particular, a film called Dark Age, giant um, crocodile movie, where we couldn't find any original materials anywhere in the world. And the only print that I knew in existence was a print that Tarantino had. And thankfully he let us borrow his, his print of the film that we um, graded and used for the film. But I think that's, there only, there's only two prints used, the rest was all off Neg. And the Mad Max material we couldn't find anywhere either. That didn't exist in Australia. I think maybe George Miller might have had it in had an interneg somewhere, but we couldn't get our hands on that. So that's the only material in Doco that came off, um, off, uh, off a digital beta cam material. Everything else was off the original neg. With a film like Mad Max, these films were made, although Mad Max now is a classic, it was made for no money. It was shot on weekends, it yeah. was made outside the system. And so w the producers of those films back in those days didn't have money to run off multiple internegs and interposers. They just sent them overseas to whoever distributed it. So a lot of the time this material went overseas and never came back. And um, so with a large, with, with some of the films, yeah, th there's one interneg somewhere and that's, that's the extent of it. No one, because the companies that bought it subsequently went bankrupt or passed it on to someone else and this stuff ends up sitting in a warehouse somewhere in Wichita and no one knows about it anymore. So I'm sure that somewhere there's like that um, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Ark of the Covenant kind of warehouse with all this Australian film material in it that we just, you know, that everyone's still looking for. There was one film, um, Plug, one of the worst Australian films ever made that's featured very briefly in the doco. It's an awful sex comedy. And that was one where we couldn't find any material anywhere. Uh, I found a couple of battered prints that were just unusable. And at the very last minute, a lab in Sydney rang me and said, we've just found this giant storage punket of material. We don't know what it is. And it ended up being all the film materials of Plug that no one had looked into um, for over 30 years. So that was quite miraculous. Although we had a decent budget, a lot of that was chewed up by the fact that we had to pay for all the rights to all the film footage. And I also made a point of going back and grading all that stuff from the original negs, because I was sick of seeing docos on film where they'd talk about these amazing films and they'd cut to the footage and it looked so ratty. So we really went out of our way to get the footage looking better than it ever had.
the edit, I have to say, the post-production was incredibly difficult as well. We ended up with um, 150 hours of interview footage, another 150 hours of film clip material, and then another 50 hours on top of that of, um, of archival, behind the scenes, historical material. So just watching that amount of material took a month, and then trying to cull that down to 100 minutes was a massive undertaking. And uh, it was always a, a fight between entertainment versus information. You know, how much, who knows, people probably don't know anything about any of these films. How much do we need to tell them about the films before we cut to the funny stories? And it was a difficult juggling act, but you know, hopefully we kind of got it right. I'm not a documentary filmmaker. I don't think of myself in any way as a documentary filmmaker and I am absolutely sure that other documentary filmmakers who see the film won't think of me as one either. And um, so I, as I mentioned, have a, a music video background. So I thought that was a more important feel to give the film than a regular documentary. Uh, in a way, I kept on saying to the two other editors, you know, think of it as a rockumentary. Um, it needs to reflect the uh, the sensibility of the films that are in it. And they had a very much a, a devil may care rock and roll sensibility. So we literally cut the living crap out of it. Um, it was just tighter, 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 tighter. When in doubt, save it for the TV edit. You know, um, and part of that was because we knew that uh, this film had been so difficult to get up that there would never be another one like it on this subject matter that whatever didn't end up in the doco would never be seen. So it was, we have to cram as much stuff into that 100 minutes as possible. And apart from that, we also knew that it wasn't a soul-searching study of the African yak. You know, it was a film about these renegade filmmakers making these down and dirty rock and roll kind of films. So we wanted to have that feel. And we also wanted to have a sensibility of the time so that you weren't looking at it from a 2008, 2009 perspective. You needed to be looking at it from a 70s perspective and if you weren't seeing it through that 70s prism, everything in it, I imagine, would be offensive. So we wanted it to have that 70s feel and set up the 70s culture. And also the animation, and which came from all the original poster art and stills, that also needed to have that kind of aesthetic as well. Uh, who knows, hopefully we pulled it off. Yeah, it was, it was amazingly liberating finishing it and people kept on saying, you know, we, we were lucky enough to open the Melbourne Film Festival, be the opening night film, and everyone just kept on saying, aren't you stressed, aren't you stressed? And I really wasn't at all because as soon as it was finished, I knew that no one could touch it anymore, that it was what it was, we were happy with it, and that no matter what people think of it, uh, you know, it was the film that I wanted to make. So it was an incredibly liberating feeling and subsequent to that, I've just been along for the ride, it's been great. And it, um, we obviously did something incredibly wrong because it got unanimously good reviews in Australia. It, it got amazing reviews from people that I just didn't expect, who obviously entertainment did win out because they didn't, I thought that people would, some people would find it incredibly offensive because it documents a time that, you know, was politically, was incredibly politically incorrect. And, uh, you know, the, the, um, it doesn't tackle a lot of gender issues or things like that people would want from a documentary like this, I always thought. But they seem to just like the fact that it was fast moving and that it was funny. And that if they wanted to get some kind of educational value out of it, if they looked hard enough, maybe they might as well. So we, we, were, we were very lucky with the reviews. And um, we had a theatrical run in Australia, which you know did very well for a documentary. We were up against Tropic Thunder and um, Hellboy too, so that never helps. But for an Australian, look, it's hard enough to get any Australians to go and see any Australian films these days, and to try to talk them into seeing a documentary on Australian film is even harder. But you know, we did all right, and um, the festival release has been incredible. People have really responded to it, and um, hopefully, the same will happen on DVD, which I think, uh, in a way, um, is where it will really find. Uh, it's home for repeated viewings. Everyone who, who, who sees it tell me that they need to see it again and they also need to take a pad to write down the films that they need to discover from the documentary. And obviously that's a lot easier to do on DVD. Although we kind of you know, coined the word um, ausploitation for the documentary, um, 
a lot of these films don't necessarily fall under the exploitation banner, but in Australia they did because, as I mentioned, every film that wasn't a period film was considered exploitation. So that's why it probably covers a, a much larger, ra larger range of films that most people um, you know, normally connect with the exploitation movement. Um, and it's interesting, uh, the other thing that I wanted to do with the film is, uh, although it is very uh, irreverent, and uh, it does, it is in a way a, a love letter to, to, to a large majority of these films, I didn't want people to walk away thinking that all these films were good because, hey, they're not. You know, there's a lot of really bad films in Not Quite Hollywood. But a lot of the time, the worse the films, the better the stories about them. So um, I think the film's pretty honest, and I think the interviewees are pretty honest about what are the good films and what are the bad films. The good thing is that after seeing the film, hopefully you'll know uh, which are the good ones and which are the bad ones and which ones you want to see. And uh, obviously there are films like Road Games and Long Weekend and Man from Hong Kong and Mad Max, Next of Kin, which are particularly good films and which are films that would be considered good films in any co country in the world, not just Australia. And there are particularly bad films like Turkey Shoot, which, uh, you know, Turkey Shoot is a particularly bad film, but once you know the stories behind the making of it, it is an incredibly entertaining film because you are watching this film unravel on screen where, you know, half the budget's vanished two days before shooting starts. They've had to rewrite the script. They've ripped the first 15 pages out. They've taken out a lot of the um, stunt sequences, added a guy in a beard who's just called a freak for no good reason and walks around ripping off toes and eating them. You know that things are going very, very wrong on that film. And when you know the stories behind them, it does make it a lot more interesting to watch. So I, I hope the one good thing that has come out of it is that people have actively sought, now they've got an excuse to actively seek out these films, find them and watch them and hopefully, um, you know, enjoy them. Not Quite Hollywood ends with um, uh, a discussion about how genre films are back in Australia, how after a long period of us not making them at all, suddenly Wolf Creek was made outside the system to a large extent. It found a huge audience and the funding body suddenly went, maybe there's gold in those hills, we should start investing in, in genre films again. And in a way that's true because up until Wolf Creek we didn't make a lot of genre films in Australia, if any. They were, they were very, very um, sparse. And now we are making them, but in a way, since Wolf Creek, audiences haven't embraced them. Um, no horror film in Australia or even um, action film or, or any film like of those genres has been a success in Australia with the exception of Wolf Creek. Everyone thought that Rogue was going to be the next big thing and um, unfortunately it wasn't. It, you know, it was a $30 million film that grossed you know, under $2 million in Australia. Um, Storm Warning went straight to DVD in Australia. Um, so it's going to be very interesting to see what happens. Uh, I honestly think that f we need to take uh, these genre films to the next level to compete on a world market. Um, because now genre films are mainstream films. You know, it's not like the old days when they played the drive-ins. Now they are the big event movies. And with cinema prices, you know, you need a good excuse to leave your home to go to a film. Uh, and you want bang for your buck. And they need to compete. And we really need in Australia someone like an Eric Banner who's a huge fan of Mad Max or a Russell Crowe, someone who's got the clout and can find the money to want to make one of these films in Australia, to really be able to, to revive that kind of filmmaking in Australia. The thing that I learnt the most on the doco, I, I you know, did a lot of research, 10 years worth of research, so I didn't think that I would learn very much making this film. I thought I'd just get people to recite the stories that I already knew. But the thing that I found the most interesting was when we spoke to Tarantino and people from overseas. In Australia, no one heard about the success of these genre films overseas. The only reports back we got were things like Picking at Hanging Rock getting a standing ovation uh, in a screening in, in New York. What we weren't told is that it was playing in one cinema in New York and the man from Hong Kong was playing down the road in 15 because they, we didn't want, people didn't want to think of those as Australian films, the genre films. And it was interesting talking to people like Tarantino who who made it very clear that these films did find enthusiastic audiences all around the world. And as I mentioned, in Australia, people thought, why are we making these American films? They, they thought that we were kind of trying to fool the rest of the world into thinking that these were American films. But overseas, people like Tarantino saw something very Australian about these films. They saw there was an Australian sensibility about them, 
whether it was a way we shot our cars, whether it was a way we filmed the bush, whatever, and I, when I say bush, I mean the outback and pubic hair, uh, we, there was something very Australian that we didn't see in Australia because we were so close to them, but people certainly picked that up overseas. And um, the other main aim, well, the, the main aim when I, I set out to make this doco was that I knew that we had filmmakers in Australia like Brian Trenchard-Smith who'd made Man from Hong Kong uh, and like Richard Franklin who'd made Road Games and Patrick and Colin Eggleston who'd made Long Weekend who were just as skilled and crafted making, in, in, you know, making films as our more lauded filmmakers like your Beresfords and your Weirs and your Skepsis. But because they'd chosen to work in genre, they'd never really got the respect they deserved. And hopefully this doco um, shines a spotlight on those guys and gives them maybe a bit of begrudging respect, hopefully. At the, the end of the film, um, there's a dedication to Richard Franklin. Um, Richard, as I mentioned, was a huge um, influence on me. I'd stayed in touch since I was a kid through his life. And he was a big uh, support of the project. Every time we got knocked back by a funding body, he'd ring up and come around and give me a pep talk, have a cup of coffee and so forth. And um, he rang me just when we got the financing to say that he had cancer. He'd had it for a year. He hadn't told anyone, but he was not going to live to see the film. But he wouldn't let me down. And we shot the last ever interview with Richard. He, was, um, he died three weeks later. He was paralysed from the waist down when we interviewed him. And... Uh, it was incredibly sad and it was at that point where I think we all realised, particularly me, that this just wasn't going to be a documentary about people telling funny stories about the industry. It was possibly the last chance and the only chance that a lot of these people would get to tell their story and it was their legacy. And one of the great things that the feedback I've got from the film, um, from the people who feature in it, is that they find it's very honest and it is a true record of that period told by the people in the trenches, not critics, not fans, not people who had no connection with these films, but with the real people who were there making them. Uh, and it's the thing that is going to survive to tell that tale. And um, that's the most gratifying thing about it.